your screen there. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome. This is Romanel Center's uh, talk. We, we have several talks a uh, semester. We invite a bunch of different guest speakers to present on a variety of bioethics topics. Uh, today we have Matthew Lau uh, on uh, antinatalism, a response to antinatalism specifically. And uh, our normal schedule is we have the, a presenter for a first uh, hour. So it's going till about four o'clock. Then we go into Q&A. So usually we have like a short break in between those two. And for Q&A, I'll be uh, fielding the questions as far as like organizing the order in which people are asking questions and all that. I'll get you guys in the queue and uh, Matthew can field all of those questions in response. Um, so uh, let's begin with uh, Matthew and let's welcome our speaker. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I was told that the paper was pre-circulated and I was asked to give, maybe do like a 20, 20 minute thing. So that's what I prepared. I hope that's okay. <laughs> uh, so that'll give us more time to talk, but I'm happy to uh, go into more of the argument if you have questions. I kind of, in the uh, presentation, I kind of skipped a lot of things. Um, so anyway, so first of all, I just want to thank uh, uh, you all for coming and thank David for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, and I see Travis is in the audience. Uh, I want to thank Travis. He actually gave me some really good feedback uh, on a previous uh, iteration of this paper. And hopefully this one is uh, slightly better, slightly improved. So I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I prepared a little PowerPoint. So I'm going to do that right now. Give me a second. All right. OK, so most people think that it's up to you to decide whether to have children or not. But the antinatalists disagree. So they believe that it's always morally wrong to have children. And here's a common thought among antinatalists. Life is full of harms. When one has a child, one is imposing all these harms on the child. If one did not have a child, such concerns would not arise. It is morally wrong to impose these harms on someone. Therefore, it is morally wrong to have children. And antinatalists are attracted to at least two types of arguments for this view. Uh, so according to the first, unless a life contains absolutely no negative things at all, it is not relevant that a life also contains positive things. The negative things in life are sufficient to render the act of bringing new individuals into existence a harm and possibly a wrong. So uh, I'm gonna call this the positives are not relevant arguments. And according to the second argument, it may be the case that life also contains positive things but as a matter of fact, almost everyone's life contains more negative things than positive things. So given this, bringing new individuals into existence is wrong, other things being equal. So I'm gonna call this positives are not enough arguments. And a goal of my paper, as you, you may have read, is to offer new reasons to reject these types of arguments. And another goal is to offer a positive view of how parents can justify their decision to bring a child into the world. Okay, so let's begin with some positives are not relevant arguments. So the first one I'm gonna consider is David Benatar's asymmetry argument. And I believe that's posted in the chat as well. So according to Benatar, there's an asymmetry between the way positive things such as benefit and pleasure and negative things such as harm and pain are evaluated. So he argues that this asymmetry entails that coming into existence is always a harm. And the argument can be put as follows. So one, the presence of harm in existence is bad. Two, the presence of benefit in existence is good. 
Three, the absence of harm in non-existence is good, even if that good is not enjoyed by anyone. Four, the absence of benefit in non-existence is not bad, unless there is someone for whom this absence is a deprivation. Five, when we compare uh, the first and the third, we see that the absence of harm in non-existence is an advantage over the presence of harm in existence. Six, when we compare the second premise with the fourth premise, we find that the presence of benefit in existence is not an advantage over the absence of benefit in non-existence. Therefore, non-existence has an advantage over existence owing to five, but existence has no advantage over non-existence owing to six. And therefore, coming to existence is always a net harm. So there are a bunch of qualifications that I mentioned in the paper. Uh, one thing I want to know here is that to show how the presence of benefit in existence is not an advantage over the absence of benefit in non-existence, Benatar offers an analogy. So he, uh, he gives the example of the sick and the healthy. So suppose that sick is prone to get sick, but fortunately he also has the capacity for quick recovery. Healthy, on the other hand, lacks the capacity for quick recovery, but he never gets sick. According to Banatar, it's, it is bad for sick that he gets sick, and it, it is good for him that he recovers quickly. While it is good for healthy that he never gets sick, but it is not bad that he lacks the capacity for quick recovery. And so if so, Benatar claims that this suggests that the capacity for quick recovery can be good for sick while not give sick a real advantage over healthy since lacking this capacity is not bad for healthy. That is healthy is not worse off than he would have been had he had the capacity for quick recovery. And so in an analogous manner, Benatar wants to say that the presence of benefit in existence could be good for X while not be an advantage over the absence of benefits um, when X does not exist. So there's a huge literature on Benatar's work uh, on this argument. And there, uh, I think these are uh, sort of two arguments that come up that I find uh, fairly plausible uh, uh, against the asymmetry argument. So the first um, points out that the asymmetry by itself does not lead to the antinatalist conclusion that bringing someone into existence is wrong. At best, it shows that uh, doing so uh, harms that individual. So, so there's a rhetorical question of, you know, what's the significance and the purpose of the asymmetry argument for antinatalism? And then there's a second issue of whether it really makes sense to say that never existing can bet be better for a person who never exists. And a bunch of people have made this point and I'll say a bit more about that shortly. What I wanna do in, in uh, this talk and in my paper is that um, I wanna suggest that they're sort of uh, accepting the asymmetry argument results in a number of counterintuitive counter implications, implications that haven't been noticed. Um, so I'm going to say what those are now. So first, for Benatar, the asymmetry between harm and benefit is applicable, uh, not just uh, to cases of an individual's existence and non-existence, but also to cases between two existent individuals. So remember his case of sick and healthy. So this implies that they, there are absent benefits that would not be considered deprivation for existent individuals. So what would some such examples be? Now, let's suppose that the absence of any intrinsic or fundamental benefits would be considered a deprivation. So some examples of absent benefits that would not be considered uh, deprivations might be uh, not engaging in mundane activities, such as walking around the neighborhood, interacting with strangers, and surfing the internet. 
Okay. So none of these activities should be considered a deprivation for an individual, should an individual not be able to participate in them. Now, suppose that's the case. It seems that Benatar's argument implies that it would be a net harm to engage in these activities. Um, and in the paper, I basically go through, um, I use, um, I go through uh, sort of Benatar syllogisms when applied to these types of activities. And, you know, you can see for yourself that it seems to imply that it results in a net harm. I'm not going to go over that in the interest of time. Okay. A second, uh, here's another implication. Suppose that Benatar is correct that it is a harm to bring new individuals into existence. It should also be a harm to engage in activities that would lead to or increase the chance of new individuals being brought into existence. But if this is the case, this implies, for example, that having sex, even when condoms are used, is a harm since condoms are not 100% effective in preventing unwanted pregnancies. It also implies that dating is a harm since dating increases the chance of new individuals being brought into existence. And in the extreme, uh, it seems to also imply that socializing and interacting with people in the checkout line at a grocery store are also a harm since such activities also increase the chance of new individuals being brought into existence. There's a third implication. So on the basis of the asymmetry argument, Benatar has happily accepted that it's a harm to bring into existence other sentient beings. So in particular, Benatar believes that his view entails that breeding animals for food consumption would be a harm. Now, in fact, however, Benatar's arguments has even more drastic implications. It implies that it is a harm to do anything that could lead to sentient lives being brought into existence. So when we grow fruits and vegetables for consumption, inevitably we bring sentient lives into existence and or contribute to sentient lives being brought into existence. Insects and animals feed off these fruits and vegetables and produce new insects and animals as a result. And even more sentient creatures are brought into existence as a result of feeding off these insects and animals. So it seems that Benatar's argument implies that it is a harm that we grow fruits and vegetables for consumption. So hence, even if we were to accept the uh, Benatar's asymmetry argument, uh, even if we accept that it's coherent, uh, the argument has implications that I think we should really question. Okay. So here's another uh, positives are not enough argument. So Schifrin um, are, 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 um, uh, are not relevant arguments. So this is sort of Schifrin's consent argument. So she basically says, uh, all lives contain significant harm such as pain, frustration, and death. Although it can be permissible to impose significant harm on an unconsenting individual in order to avert a greater harm, it is morally impermissible to impose a significant harm on an unconsenting individual for the sake of granting that individual a benefit. There's no harm in not coming into existence. Therefore, uh, bring a new individual into existence grants that individual a pure benefit. That is something that is good, but whose absence will not be considered a harm or deprivation. Therefore, bring a new individual into existence imposes a significant harm on an unconsenting individual for the sake of granting that individual a benefit. Therefore, it's, it's morally impermissible to bring an individual into existence. So here are some additional concerns that, uh, with uh, the consent argument. Uh, in the paper, I mentioned other concerns that other people have. So, so first, typically bringing uh, a new individual into existence does not by itself cause harm to that individual. The types of harm that Schifrin has in mind, such as pains, frustrations, and death, usually occur downstream from being brought into existence, that is, later in life. And more importantly, 
these types of harm are typically not intended. That is, parents who bring a new individual into existence do not usually intend to cause their offspring these types of harm. At best, they foresee that their offspring will experience these types of harm. So I think that while it may be impermissible to intend to cause harm, it can be permissible to perform an action foreseeing that harm may later result. So I'm appealing to the doctrinal double effect here. So this explains, for example, why parents are permitted to send their children to soccer camps. Because while they may foresee that the children may get injured, they typically do not intend that their children be injured. And since typically bringing a new individual into existence does not by itself cause harm to that individual, and since the types of harm that Schifrin has in mind, such as pains, frustrations, and death are typically not intended, it seems that it can be permissible to bring a new individual into existence foreseeing that harm may later result. And then secondly, I think we should ask again whether it makes sense to claim of someone who has just been brought into existence that he has a right to consent to whether he should have been brought into existence. Um, I say more about this and this, uh, but it just seems difficult to make sense of this right, given that having this right is predicated on this individual's existing. So let, let, uh, let me just give, uh, uh, consider a positives are not enough argument. So Benatar's quality of life argument. So Benatar argues that as a matter of fact, for almost everyone, the positive things in life do not outweigh the negative things. And he goes, he considers sort of three influential theories of well-being, and he argues that on each theory, human lives proves to be very bad. So for, for example, take a hedonistic theory, which assesses the quality, quality of life on the extent to which uh, the life is characterized by positive or negative mental states. Benatar argues that most people's lives contain much more negative mental states than we typically recognize. So for instance, uh, he notices that everyone spends much of the day in discomfort, uh, owing to hunger, thirst, tiredness, and so on. Many people regularly suffer allergies, uh, colds, menstrual pains, nausea, chronic pains, and some people regularly experience frustration, boredom, and so on and so forth. And he also observes that while, while one can be injured, be injured or fall ill in seconds, recovery is often slow and sometimes not possible at all. Or take the desire fulfillment theory, according to which the quality of a life, a person's life is assessed in terms of the extent to which one's desires are fulfilled. Benatar first points out that desires that we lack are never satisfied immediately, which means that we need to suffer a period of frustration before uh, the desires are fulfilled. For instance, graduate students desire permanent jobs, but they have to endure a lot of uncertainty on the way to achieving professional security. And next, even when some of our desires are finally fulfilled, Benatar says that, well, they only last uh, a little while. And furthermore, um, sometimes the fulfillment of some desires just lead to more unfulfilled desires. So for, ex for instance, once we get one publication, we typically just want to have more publications and so on and so forth. Um, I won't go through all the examples. And then lastly, uh, consider objective list theories, according to which the quality of a person's life is assessed in terms of whether it contains certain objective goods such as knowledge, friendship, and achievement. Now, Benatar's uh, complaint against uh, objective list theories is that they are constructed from a human perspective rather than from a truly objective perspective. So according to Benatar, they can't really tell us how good a human life is because from the human perspective, what we take to be worthwhile is very much determined by the limits of what we can expect. So for instance, uh, say that knowledge is an objective good. Benatar argues that even the best educated humans know, uh, uh, know very little. Or say living longer is an objective good. 
Benatar says that the longest human lives are still very short, objectively speaking. So here are some things that I wanna say. So in response to what he says about the humanistic uh, theories, I think what Benatar needs to show here is that there are in fact more negative mental states than positive mental states in most people's lives, not just what, not just sort of what we realize. And as far as I can tell, Benatar has not counted up all the negative and positive mental states in a person's life. And it's doubtful whether uh, he or anyone else could be able to do this type of calculation to support this empirical claim. Um, and you might think, look, okay, it's, maybe it's true that there are more negative things that we, we haven't recognized or realized, but there are still many positive things. And so, uh, Anyways, the, the best thing that's, the, you know, the best case for him is that, you know, it remains to be shown. So, and I think similar things can be said about the desire for what he says about the desire fulfillment. Again, he hasn't counted up all of the unfulfilled and fulfilled desires in a person's life. And so given this, even if we agree with him that we have many more unfulfilled desires than we typically recognize, what he needs to show is that we have in fact uh, more, uh, we in fact have more unfulfilled desires than fulfilled ones in our lives. And with respect to the object, what he says about the objective list theories, uh, his complaints that there are many things that would be good for humans that are beyond uh, our reach, such as living longer or knowing more. But what Benatar needs to show is not that life, a life could be better if that life had more of the objective goods but that that life is bad just because it did not have more of the objective goods. So here Benatar seems to be assuming that if something is an objective good, then we should try to have as much of it as possible, you know, some sort of maximizing condition. Um, but why, makes, uh, why make this assumption? Even if one were, one were to grant that having more of an objective good makes a human life better, why not think that a human life is good enough if one has enough of the objective goods. So, you know, suppose that someone lives until 90 years old and has read, has read 50,000 books. Now, let's grant that this person's life would be even better if she lived until 130 years old and read, uh, she has read 100,000 books. Is this person's life uh, therefore bad? just because she didn't live to 130 years old and she hadn't read 100,000 books? It does not seem so, right? It seems that we can say that she has enough, uh, a good enough life, if, even if we grant that she could have an even better life. So I think if, if all of this is right, Benatar has not shown that most human lives are bad. Okay, so in the paper, I then sort of go on to discuss how parents can and should justify their decision to bring a child into the world. And in a nutshell, my proposal is that parents have a human right to, uh, to bring a child into the world and their right to do so typically does not violate any rights that an unborn child may have. And so elsewhere, I've argued that the first claim is true because uh, human beings have human rights to what I call the fundamental conditions for pursuing the basic activities in a good life. And I've also argued that biological parenting is a basic activity. I won't go over the first claim, happy to say more about it in the Q&A, but here's why biological parenting, uh, or at least consensual biological parenting is a basic activity. And by basic activity, I mean one of those activities that is important to a human being, qua human being's life as a whole. And I think bi biological parenting qualifies as a basic activity because it involves um, four, uh, four things. First, creating a new life. Second, uh, a, li a life that's a right holder uh, or a potential right holder. Uh, the third condition is with one's genetic material, which in part determines the genetic identity of this new individual. And uh, fourthly, one has the opportunity to see and shape the growth of this new individual. Um, and so if I'm right about this and the, I give the argument in the, um, 
in, in the paper, it follows that we have the fundamental rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing biological parenting. And what that means is that we have the, uh, among other things, this means that we have the fundamental rights to bodily integrity, um, uh, liberty and autonomy to plan and pursue biological parenting and the power to exclude others from trying to be the primary providers for one's biological child. I claim in the paper that these are some of the fundamental conditions for pursuing biological parenting. Okay, so, um, so a parent's right to be, uh, in the paper I then go on to say that a parent's right uh, to be a biological parent typically does not violate any right that an unborn child may have. So why is this? So let's start by considering what rights future human beings uh, have. So in my view, they have the same rights that cur uh, current human beings have, namely the human, right, uh, human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. Now, if this is right, this means that we have the responsibility to make sure that future human beings have the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. Um, it also means that we would be violating their rights if we don't fulfill these responsibilities. So we can call this a uh, human rights approach to procreative responsibility. Now, as far as I'm aware, most biological parents do fulfill their responsibility to ensuring that their offspring have the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So given this, uh, most biological parents do not violate the rights of their offspring just by bringing their offspring into existence. So they have a right to bring them into existence and they don't, they typically don't violate their rights. Uh, so, but, you know, antinatalists might argue that, well, one has a right not to be harmed, un understood as a right not to be placed in circumstances in which there's a good chance one would experience harm of some sort. But I think this claim is questionable. Uh, through our uh, ordinary actions, we regularly put people in circumstances in, in which there's a good chance they would experience harm of some sort. So take air travel, for example. Um, so if in doing so, we would thereby be violating their rights, it seems that all of us would have to stay home to avoid putting others at risk uh, of harm in this kind of way. Uh, secondly, Morality does not require moral agents to eliminate all kinds of harms. Typically, morality only requires moral agents to refrain from uh, inflicting intended harms and to minimize causing intentional and unintentional harms. So when biological parents decide to bring a child into existence, they typically do not intend to harm that child. And most of them do strive to minimize causing intentional and unintentional harms to their offspring. So given this, it seems that generally uh, biological parents do not violate um, any rights that an unborn child may have when they bring the child into existence. So just to wrap up, um, antinatalists have uh, sought to show that procreation is a harm and a wrong by claiming that there's an asymmetry in our evaluation between the absence of negative things and the absence of positive things that the unborn has not consented to being born and that human lives actually contain more negative things than positive things. And what I try to suggest is that these arguments are not successful. And I then propose that parents are justified in bringing children into the world because as human beings, parents have a human right to engage in biological parenting and their right to, to do so typically does not violate any right that an unborn child may have. So I think this human rights approach seems like a right response to uh, antinatalism and deserves further consideration in the literature. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen. Alrighty. All right. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, uh, did you want to take a, a break now or you want to go right into Q&A? Ah, okay, go right in. All righty. So uh, for our q and I would encourage you guys to uh, use the reactions button and do raise hand. 
and that will allow me to add you into a queue. And if you want, you could instead just pet, like private message me in the chat and I will add you there. And then uh, I'll just let you know who is next in line. So let me see if I can switch uh, views there. Um, so for those who have uh, questions, use the raise hand feature or throw in chat. Uh, we'll start with Neil and then Travis. Uh, thanks, Matthew. It's good to meet you. I enjoyed the talk in the paper. Very nice um, to meet you. I'll, I'll start with like a very um, specific focused kind of question um, on, uh, so I, I completely agree with you um, that the, this is on the asymmetry argument that I agree with your overall evaluation, but I'm not so sure about one of your criticisms, one of your new criticisms, like the, your, your idea of non-deprivational activities. Mm -hmm. so I took your criticism to be that, you know, the Benatar asymmetry argument would prove too much, right? It would prove that engaging in these non-deprivational activities is, is always a net harm, okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that does seem implausible. But um, I'm not sure why we should think that the, the activities that you talk about um, are non-deprivational in the relevant sense. So in, in other words, why, why would Benatar admit that if a person exists, um, there are any non-deprivational activities for that person? Why wouldn't he just say that um, if a person exists, then the absence of a benefit, um, let's see, well, um, would, would be a deprivation. Would be a, so so um, yeah. uh, talking to a random stranger, getting some pleasure from talking to a random stranger. Um, it seems to me that he would and could say that um, this is a deprivation um, because the person exists and is not getting uh, the benefit. So, so um, if that makes sense, um, I'm thinking why, uh, why would we think that um, if someone exists and is not receiving a certain benefit, why would we think that that um, doesn't count as a deprivation? Yeah, great, great question. I, I think that's, that's really important. So it comes down to whether, uh, so Benatar is, uh, I think he, uh, draws a distinction between the sort of activities that are deprivational from activities that are not deprivational. Um, and I was kind of inheriting that language from him. Um, but what you're saying now is, well, maybe he's like, he could give that up and just sort of say, look, all activities are deprivational, right? And if he, if he gives that up, then, well, you know, you have that, right? Then, then, uh, this is not a problem because everything is intrinsic. Uh, anything you do is intrinsic. Anything you do is deprivational um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess I just think, I mean, that seems to, I mean, that's another bullet to bite, but, you know, Benatar's known to be happy with biting bullets. So, uh, so I don't know what I would say to him if, um, if he were to bite that bullet as well as, many of you know, uh, all the other ones. Um, but I mean, the, I guess the question for us sort of just sitting, we're evaluating. So we're trying to figure out whether the antinatalism view is correct. And do we really believe that all activities are the same? Like, you know, so take like raw things like counting blades of grass, right? It's kind of like, look, it's just mean, you know, it doesn't mean anything, you know, whatever. There are many examples or just sort of, um, you know, uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, take that example, right? And so uh, unless we're willing to say that, look, even that, you know, contributes to human life, like everything does, or, you know, like everything is deprivational, then, um, you know, um, I mean, you know, like, do you want to say that? Like, what, what do you think? So, uh, so I agree one strategy would be just to bite the bullets and anybody can do that. The other, but I guess uh, in addition to that, we want to evaluate the sort of the plausibility of biting, like of that move, right? And so we, you know, so I guess um, myself, I think, look, it, it, you know, I, and he initially, I mean, just, you know, for rhetorical or so dialectical, uh, you know, reasons, he initially, 
they, you know, the, dep- the, uh, the idea of deprivation comes from him and also comes from Schiffer, right? Um, and so uh, do you think that there's not, that, like, we should just get rid of this distinction now? Oh, thanks. Um, you know, I, it's been so long since I read the, you know, the, like, 2006, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, that I I might be misremembering. Um, so and I, I might I might have my uh, details wrong. But I, I guess I was just assuming since that what was at stake is comparing um, existence and non-existence that um, that that was the sort of the the basis on which um, something would count as uh, being a deprivation or not. But I mean maybe I'll go back and re-familiarize myself with that because I'm now I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. All right, then uh, let's go to Travis and then uh, Phil after him. Hi, uh, yeah. So let me just start off by saying thanks for the great paper and um, also for the kind words at the beginning. Um, so I wanted to uh, raise first like a nitpicky point and then uh, maybe uh, hopefully a kind of a helpful point. So th- first, thanks for the uh, Shout out in the footnote in the paper too. I was uh, oh. quite thankful. That I didn't expect that when I was reading your version to come across that. Um, so here's the nitpicky point about that. Uh, I don't know oh. if Editor would have to say that, um, like uh, in the condom example, that that's a harm, but I think he would have to say that it's a risk of harm at least. Because I think he could say whether something constitutes a harm or not depends upon what the like actual rather than like uh, possible uh, outcomes could be from that, but that's not a problem for you. It, it would just be uh, adding in this like qualifier that uh, you risk harm when you engage in these actions because we uh, lack certainty about what the outcome is going to be. And that can be enough to generate at least subjective moral obligations to refrain from engaging in what seems pre-theoretically like perfectly permissible behavior. Okay, now here's the maybe hopefully sort of helpful addendum to that. Okay, good. Uh, is that if there's very serious like uh, risks of harming people by bringing them to existence, like Benatar thinks, uh, then it might also give us, uh, at least given other plausible normative assumptions, strong moral reason to act in ways that uh, prevent people from doing these things. So not only is it counterintuitive that it would be impermissible for us to take these risks to uh, engage in these activities that seem pre-theoretically perfectly permissible, Uh, But given other assumptions, which admittedly Benatar does not explicitly commit himself to, but which seem plausible in their own right, uh, we could, you know, it could generate very strong, like positive duties for us to interfere in other people's lives to prevent them from engaging in these seemingly perfectly uh, permissible activities. And that seems uh, very surprising. Now, you're, you know, I agree with you. I I like David. I like his work a lot, but he does like to bite bullets. So maybe he would just bite the bullet there. But that doesn't, um, you know, that's not going to uh, be a dialectically effective move for people who don't share those sorts of inclinations to bite the bullets that he does. Um, so yeah, now one, oh, one other sort of nitpicky thing is maybe Benatar would say, well, look, uh, because of the something like the butterfly effect, maybe we often don't know whether, you know, talking to someone in a grocery store or, you know, having sex using protection is actually going to increase the risk of people coming into existence. And that point is, uh, I mean, I think maybe accurate, but it's not going to get him very far because we can just imagine a possible world uh, where your epistemic position is such that this really is going to uh, minimize the chance of people coming to existence. And then in that possible world, in that epistemic state, you would get these seeming moral obligations to refrain from engaging in those activities. And that seems, I don't know, that seems wild to me. I share your, share your judgments about that. Yeah, okay, no, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Travis. Uh, really, really great points. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll mention that. I think it doesn't, the risk of harm versus harm. I guess the only thing is, um, I take it Benatar sometimes run the argument, like, well, at least this comes, uh, uh, it might be more obvious in the case of Schiffer, but I was thinking that Benatar would think the same, like the risk of harm is a kind of harm for them. Right, so there are a bunch of farms there, sort of, but even like sort of like dropping the gold cubes, for example, for Schifrin, right? There's a risk that you'll get hit, right? It doesn't require that people be hit. Well, I mean, in her case, it does, you know, like someone's arm was broken, right? 
but I think that um, I, I take it her, her, she thinks that her argument goes through just in virtue of just imposing that risk on somebody, you're already harming them in some sense. And so, um, so I, I do think that's right, like that if you just have a, a broader notion of harm would include the risk of harm or something like that. Um, so that's sort of, I just, you know, um, one thought that I had. Um, the second thing was about, um, oh yeah, sort of forcing people, you know, to not do these things. Um, yeah, I didn't want to put words in Benatar's mouth, you know, because he may or may not. I mean, there, you know, I think with certain plausible assumptions about what our moral obligations are and what we should do, some people could very well think that, well, this further implies that you should be forcing other, you know, you know, you should force them not to engage in these acts. Um, I, I, yeah, and so, do you know what? Like, do you, that does he have to? I wasn't. Um, uh, I'm not sure if he's committed to that view. So um, I, I think, yeah. So anyways, I, I didn't want to attribute, you know, anything that he didn't say, um, um, you know, to him. So, uh, and then the third one is just that, I, that's right. It's sort of, it's, it's, a, 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 it's epistemic, uh, but I think, you know, given what we know about uh, things happen at checkout, you know, like grocery stores, you know, there are plenty of movies about that, you know, where, people meet at grocery stores and then they start dating and this, you know, stuff like that, or sort of, uh, you know, uh, back in the days when we used to fly around, you know, sort of like you know, air travel, you know, that's, you know, like people meet their spouses, you know, through air travel and stuff like that. There are a lot of things. It seems like it just, it's just over the place, you know, you risk, uh, um, you and you know you risk uh, getting into a relationship and therefore producing children just in virtue of just walking around and talking to people. You know you kind of have to um, you know be do what we're doing now in the pandemic, put on your mask and just like stay away six feet from other people, you know, or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. May I follow up uh, briefly to that? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so just to answer your question, I think you're absolutely right that Benatar does not commit himself to the claim that we have these positive duties. Um, but I still think it's true that uh, his view in conjunction with these very plausible normative assumptions, even if he himself doesn't commit himself to those, even if he himself doesn't endorse them, um, generates this uh, surprising conclusion. So he either has to uh, accept the surprising conclusion, which counts against his view, or he has to reject these plausible normative assumptions, which I think would also count against his view. So whether or not he takes on these other normative commitments, he doesn't say one way or the other. I do think that counts against them. And then uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, is that your point about the risk of harm, I think um, you're, you're right about Schiffer, and I don't think Benatar commits himself one way or the other. My own view is I don't think it's a good idea to say that um, imposing a risk is itself a harm. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I think, uh, you know, if something is a harm for you, that gives you prudential reason to avoid it. And that would mean that if you can, like, say, pay money to avoid incurring some sort of harm, you should do so, or you can substitute a lesser harm in place of it. So that suggests that you should, you know, incur some sort of intrinsic bad, like pain to avoid incurring a risk of a great deal of pain. And that seems like you should only do that if, in fact, you're going to suffer a great deal of pain from the risk. If it's a mere risk of harm, but you can be certain that the risk isn't actually going to result in any sort of intrinsic bad, um, if that is a coherent uh, assumption to make, uh, then it seems like you shouldn't pay anything to avoid incurring the risk at all. Uh, that's Maybe that's confused, but I don't think it matters either way for your argument, because a risk of harm can generate moral obligations to avoid putting people at that risk, given our finite cognitive state. Okay. I'll stop now. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very. Thanks very much, Travis. All right, uh, Phil Reed, and then after that, Steve Kirshner. Okay, um, I have a question about the same part of the paper. Um, first of all, I'm hoping to get some tips on how to go to the grocery store or fly in airplanes from Matthew. <laughs> um, but seriously. So, and I don't know who, yeah, so I don't know who gave you this suggestion in the paper, but you, you know, you, um, that person should not be thanked in footnote. 
No, just kidding, Travis. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the idea is supposed to be that the asymmetry argument leads to these implausible um, implications. And my question is about the second and third of those um, that Travis was just talking to you about. Uh, so couldn't you just say that, yeah, um, yes, those things, you know, engaging with strangers is a harm as much as it increases the chance of someone coming into existence. But couldn't Benatar also just say it's a much less relative harm because it's more remote from causing existence than say having sex without a condom, for example. Um, and isn't part of the asymmetry argument supposed to be that you know, causing people to come into existence in a direct way is a harm because it's so great of a harm compared to the possible benefits that could be had. Whereas if you, you know, interact with strangers or grow fruit and vegetables, um, that, that could be a harm. And, and, and I, I would think Benatar would bite that bullet. Um, it's just that there are other things to be weighed against that harm. And also the, the fact that what we're trying to do in engaging those activities, which is why uh, we need double effect, as you uh, discussed in section four of your paper and have written on elsewhere. So um, I guess I just think, you know, Benatar could bite the bullet there and say, yes, these are harms, but um, they're much less significant harms that, that, that because the, the, whether we put it in terms of risk of causing a harm or whether we put it in terms of the amount of harm that's caused uh, relative to the action is so much smaller compared to you know, direct ways of procreating. Um, and I think that would be a bullet that, you know, at least I would be, if, if we're evaluating the bullet biting, as you talked about earlier, would be willing to bite um, because I think one isn't trying to, um, to cause harm in, in those cases. In fact, it's, it's um, you know, very, very remote from the action. Great, thank you, Philip, uh, for that really good question. Um, so, um, I think you're right that ordinarily that's how we think about it, right? We think, well, you know, maybe it's it's sort of relatively speaking, um, you know, it could let's grant that it could be a harm, but there's also a bunch of benefits and stuff like that. And so, you know, like on the whole, the the benefits, the advantages outweigh the costs or something like that, right? I what I try to say in the paper is that I don't think this works for Benatar because of his asymmetry, right? Sort of the asymmetry argument. And so, in, so uh, what's going on in, um, so in the paper, I don't know if you have the paper with, uh, in front of you, but sort of there's a premise six where I say, look, when we compare the second, uh, when we apply, basically when we apply this thing, I'll, I'll just read it. We find that the presence of benefit when, in, when engaging in non-deprivational activities is not an advantage, over the absence of benefit when engaging in non-deprivational activities, okay? So for example, talking to a stranger and having a pleasant time chatting is a good, uh, is good, it's not an advantage over not talking to a stranger and having a pleasant time chatting, okay? Um, and so because of that asymmetry, we get the result that uh, not engaging in non-deprivational activities has an advantage over engaging in non-deprivational activities, right? But engaging in non-deprivational activities has no advantage over not engaging in non-deprivational activities, okay? So anyway, I mean, the, I, the, that, that's like a whole mouthful. It's hard to follow that. But the, the, the idea is that once you apply that uh, symmetry, it turns out that the benefits um, that you're talking about doesn't get counted for because of the asymmetry argument, right? Whereas the cost, so then what you get is just the net harm. Um, does that make sense? It's a, it's a, it's a parallel argument, it's like similar, you know, this is the argument that uh, Benatar wanted to run or wants to run in the case of existence, right? Uh, the, the benefit of existence doesn't get counted, whereas the harm gets counted, so you have an asymmetry. And so I'm sort of saying, well, actually, uh, for him, the argument, the deprivational stuff, it doesn't matter whether it's existing or not existing. And so the benefit of all the benefits that you're talking about, they also don't get counted. And so what you're left with 
is just net harm. So it doesn't matter if it's relative or if it's small, right? Once the benefits don't get counted, all, you, all you're left with are harms, right? Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Um, yeah. But why, well, why wouldn't it matter that how small the harm is? I mean, if the net harm of growing fruit is really small and the net harm of causing people to exist you know, is really big, um, that's, that would seem to matter to our, our ideas about those activities. Good. So take Benatar's argument. I, I, you, can, you can say the same thing back to him, right? And sort of say, look, maybe the net harm of existence is really small, right? And the benefit of existence is really good, right? And then he wants to say, well, that doesn't matter because because of the asymmetry, the benefit uh, the benefits don't get counted. And so you are left with uh, the net harm and it doesn't matter. I think this is what Benatar would say. It doesn't matter that the net harm is really small. Like that's grand, you know, let's for, for argument's sake, you're right, right? Even if it's very small, it's still uh, more than the, it, it, it's just, there's no, the goods don't get counted. So there's just net harm. And so it's like, whether it's small or not, it's still, there's something there in that column or it's, you know, like in the goods column, you, you don't count any of that. So you get net harm period, right? And that's why, uh, that's why he thinks this argument is so powerful. It shows, it doesn't matter if you can show him that um, the harm is big or small or whatever, right? As long as there's this asymmetry, then that's a reason for thinking that bring someone to existence is a harm. I think that's what he would say. And so, um, and I, I mean, I think he said that before, but you know, anyways, I think this is what he would say, but if that's true, and if there's no difference between sort of existence and non-existence, as he also seems to claim with respect to the sick and healthy, then I wanna say the same thing. I, I, that's why I say, you know, this seems to also, have the same implications in the case of these types of things. So, thanks, uh, Steve Kirshner, and then uh, David Vershnov. Thank you. I, I enjoyed the talk. Um, my my question has to do with the notion of human rights that you use mm. in part to solve the problem. Um, we could look at the things which make a life go well and, and use things like having um, loving relationships with others, um, creative work and play, uh, passive pleasures like appreciating beauty. Or we could say that the right focuses on the conditions which enable those. Let's call those enabling conditions. You seem to indicate that you think human rights focus on the enabling conditions, not the conditions themselves. But my concern is um, what about cases where the two come apart? So imagine we have an individual who would have a really successful life if she were to have none of the enabling conditions. Let's say she's a drug addict who's out of control so that if we recognize her enable conditions, she's not gonna have a, a successful life qua human. On the other hand, if we don't recognize her conditions, right? So we just ignore her autonomy altogether and force her into a uh, Catholic lifestyle, then what she's gonna do is she going, she's gonna have a very successful life. She's gonna have all those conditions met to a high degree and so the claim is that um, what we either look at the basic justifier, which is a life that goes well, or we look at the enabling conditions. So um, my concern would be this, if the justifier has to be what either makes someone's life go well or what, what makes the world a better place, it's gotta be those basic conditions. But your theory seems to focus on the enabling conditions. So it seems to identify the wrong place. And that's why if we were to have an account like yours, it would seem it properly understood. It seemed that we should uh, say that the woman has no human rights um, because that's what we want to value. Yeah, great, great, great question. So, um, so I guess one thing is um, the reason I go for, you're, you're exactly right. I go for the enabling conditions rather than sort of the good life itself. And one reason I do that is because I think we can't guarantee that someone has a good life, right? The and so, you know, that's sort of one reason why we should go for the enabling conditions. And then the other thing I would say is just that, uh, I, I, so I'm a, I'm a conjunctivist about um, enabling conditions, 
So I think that for any given activity, say, you know, um, if you say deep personal relationship is a basic activity, then the, con the fundamental conditions for, you know, pursuing deep personal, uh, deep personal relationship, so you'll have a right to that, whether or not you're gonna want to exercise that right or not, right? Um, and so in that way, uh, and the reason for that is just, so, you know, uh, that, you know, you may change your mind. So, you know, I have in mind here, for example, uh, someone like a hermit, right? So imagine, so on my view, for example, hermits can live perfectly good lives, right? Or someone can decide not to have children, right? And they can have uh, live perfectly good lives in my view, right? But I think, I still think that they have a right to the conditions for being able to uh, pursue parenting or to have friends should they change their minds, right? Um, and then, so, so I think there are advantages to looking at uh, the, is the, the issue from the enabling conditions because, um, you know, you, um, yeah, basically, I don't think you can guarantee that someone has a good life. And, you know, what you can make sure is that they have these conditions to be able to pursue the basic activities, right? Um, and then, uh, let me see, maybe I'll just say one other thing. Uh, here's another case where um, uh, I also think that people can have good lives without having all the enabling conditions, right? And that's another, I think this is a feature of the view, right? So imagine that, um, you know, you can imagine that, uh, you know, women were oppressed, you know, maybe a hundred years ago and, and so on and so forth. Probably many of those like, well, they, women didn't have a right to vote, right? For example, right? You might think they have a right to vote. Like they, they, they have the right to, you know, yeah, they have that right, but they weren't given the opportunity to do so. Um, even so, it, like, it would be very strange for someone to say that uh, they didn't, they couldn't have a good life, you know, until now that they, you know, have a, you know, like they, they could live a good life. But what the enabling conditions does is to say, look, it doesn't matter whether it, you know, we're not tracking well-being here. We're tracking whether, what you can do and so on and so forth. And so, you know, um, these, uh, uh, you know, women still have the right to vote, even though, uh, you know, like that's compatible with their having a very good life, you know, even though their rights were curtailed, you know, and so, uh, and you can say similar things about, you know, uh, people in living in sort of authoritarian countries and so on and so forth. Um, did I uh, did I answer your question? Like, yeah. I, I mean, you said a lot of interesting things. That, so, but my question is going to be more specific. So, so here's the hypothetical. I'm just going to stipulate. Yeah. yeah the, the woman badly addicted to drugs will have a bad life qua human if she has human rights and, and a good life qua human if she does not. Yeah. Given that the basic justifier has to function on the good life level and not on the enabler, the enabler is the most derivative value. I got it. Oh, yeah. My yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a yes or no question. Does the yeah. woman have human rights? And my, my claim is that your approach yeah. has to say the answer is no. Although, you know, um, Bob and David might have human rights, the addict does not. And, and they want to claim that's implausible. So that's my, that's my concern. So the question is, does the addict, does the addicted woman have human rights? Yeah, so I was, uh, sorry, I didn't, I, I, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. So uh, I think the, look, there are human rights to a bunch of things. Like one of the rights that you have is a right to sort of be able to choose, right? Um, you know, another right is, you know, like you have a right to health, right? And so here's like a conflict here, right? So we both uh, think that this, uh, this, uh, this woman who's addicted uh, has a right to choose, but also has a right to health, right? And so there's a conflict. And so uh, what you're, I think what you're saying here is something like, in this case, sometimes we might favor her right to health over her right to choose. So put her in a kind of, you know, like put her in an institution where she can rehabilitate or something like that, right? Um, I guess I'm not seeing how that undermines. So, uh, because if you think, you know, like, one of the fundamental conditions is going to be your right to, you have a right to basic health. Another is say the right to decide how to live your life, right? And in this case, there's a conflict, right? Um, and so we, in this case, we're favoring her right to basic health over her right to uh, decide things for herself. 
I, uh, I'm not seeing why this shows that she doesn't have human rights, right? I mean, we can still recognize that um, what we, uh, the way I see this case is that this is a, this is a tragic case, is a dilemma where we kind of have to pick one over the other, but just in virtue of picking one over the other doesn't mean that the right doesn't exist any longer. It just means that uh, the right gets outweighed, uh, one right gets outweighed by another in this particular case. Does that help? I'm not sure. It, it does help. I just, uh, yeah. for a moment, I'll stop. Um, I, it strikes me when you introduce the right to choose that that's not your theory. I mean, that, that's a will theory, which says that what justifies human rights is autonomy, but you haven't put forth an autonomy theory. You've put forth a good life theory, which is your human rights theory. And I'm just not sure how that fits with what you've put forth. If you want to introduce the right to choose, I'm all for that. But I just, um, I'll, while you're, you, you know, it works really interesting. I just don't see that as consistent with your theory. Uh, so just to uh, say in my, when I, uh, so if you look at my work, I actually talk, so the right to choose, the right to autonomy is a fundamental condition uh, to be able to pursue the basic activities, right? Um, so there are a bunch of conditions, but you gotta have, uh, you gotta have autonomy, you gotta have liberty. Um, you know, I think I talked about the right to bodily integrity. So right to autonomy is one of the conditions for being able to pursue different things. Like how can you pursue uh, basic activities that you endorse if you don't have the right to choose, right? So it is a, so I, I think, uh, I, I didn't say it explicitly in the talk, but it's in the paper. And so it's a, it's one of the fundamental conditions. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, David Hershenov, and then we've got, uh, I think, pronounce it Danki. Uh, it's Dan Chi. Dan Chi. So the Q is a CH sound. All right, thank you. Hi, Matthew. Thank you. Hi, Look David. Forward to, to catching up during the Zoom drinks afterwards. Yes. <laughs> I had a couple Benatar more explication questions, although maybe mm -hmm. one's a criticism of him. Let's see what you think. Uh, your argument against positives are insufficient. It does he have that view? Because remember, he has that distinction between um, starting a life and continuing a life. So I thought he had the view that many people, not as many as we probably think because we're Pollyannish, um, uh, have reasons to continue a life. So in their case, it sounds like the positives would outweigh the negatives. And then the second thing is I don't really understand this distinction, starting a life, beginning a life, um, or at least that aspect of it, that harms have to be really great for you to have a reason not to continue a life, but they don't, these evils don't have to be great not to start a life. And I think his idea is, um, you know, once you exist, you have all these other interests. And so if you lose your leg, they're going to be um, uh, swamped. It, the reason to still live is you have all these other interests and goods. But if you're beginning a life, and for him, you know, beginning a life, he means the moral sense of existence, which is this process in utero or something like that. Um, and he thinks if you don't exist or you're beginning a life or you just do exist, you don't have many interests that would outweigh that loss being born without a leg. But it sounds like he almost has a time relative interest of benefits but not a time relative interest of harm. Because sure, you don't have many interests in utero or newborn, but it's also not bad to have, be missing a leg then. It only becomes bad when you wanna dance and do sports and drive and walk. So it becomes later bad. So it's, I don't understand why this double standard that harms early. And when it later becomes bad, you have all those other interests, those other time relative interests, which will then wait it. And clearly it can't be a general rule that to end a life or to not to continue a life, you need a great harm. Cause you could just imagine someone near the end of their life and you might just think a little harm would be a reason not to continue. So is that his view? I mean, how does his view um, tie in the first question to continuing life or is he just talking about starting a life? And then what do you think about thinking there's a difference in harms? You need a, you don't need much of a harm to to, to not start a life or end it when it's starting or end, or even talk about ending it soon after it starts in resp response to some parfit uh, um, thing about, you know, you can 
break up someone's leg right after they're born, so why not before? So I, does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. So thank, thank, thanks for uh, uh, mentioning that distinction between starting life and continuing life. So I think when he invokes that uh, distinction, and Travis, you should jump in here anytime because you know this literature really well. Um, so uh, he's trying to address sort of this idea. So some people think, well, if antinatalism is true, does that mean that I should just go kill myself right now? Right, because uh, you know life is full of harm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and, uh, as you know, with the you know, um, and so he wants to say, well, uh, no, you don't have to do that, and the reason you don't have to do that is because you're continuing your life, right? So there's sort of stuff that are, that's sort of good for you, right? Whereas um, starting a life, he thinks, well, there's this asymmetry, right? Sort of you, um, you know, um, so. Uh, so yeah, in a, in a nutshell, he thinks that makes a difference. Uh, that ex that that distinction allows him to say, no, you don't have to go kill yourself right now. You know, even if antinatalism were true. Um, I guess in res um, um, like how far can we? So um, so let's say that it's true that. Um, um, it's true that you have a you have an interest in continuing your life, right? That explains a bunch of the, and this is what we were talking about it, uh, about earlier, right? That explains a bunch of interests that you might have that are intrinsic or deprivational, right? So, interest in continuing the life itself, for example, would be a deprivational one, and if you were to sort of kill yourself and that would be really bad for you, right? Um, so he thinks, well, you don't have to uh, give that up or something like that. Um, and so the move I was trying to make was, but you know, assuming that there are also non deprivational non activities, right? The view seems to commit you to saying that, well, there are all these non deprivational stuff, right? Then you know, it would be it would be a net harm, right? Uh, to engage in those activities, right? So, uh, so agreeing that while some activities could be deprivational, so they could, you know, and that, you know, um, could be in your interest to pursue them. There's still many other activities, I think, that are non-deprivational, right? Um, and so anyways, that, that's how I situate the argument. Um, so what, uh, can you just remind me your second question, second point? I, I, the sorry, I the claim that. was that you don't, uh, not having a leg isn't weighty enough when you're old to, to, not to continue life, but it would be weighty enough not to start a life or if it has already started, still weighty enough. And I just didn't see that. Um, like I said, I thought it was like a time relative interest of benefits, but not of harms. He's making out like having a leg in utero, missing that leg is really bad or soon afterwards, but it's not. It's going to be bad later. And then it's just going to be like continuing a life. You'll have all these, by the time it comes bad, you'll have an interest in dancing and walking and driving and so forth. Um, and then I just said, as a general rule, it can't be true because you can have a very little reason late at life not to continue because you just don't have much time left. And a very little harm could tip the scales. Um, so it just doesn't seem, a lot of people talk that way. I will abort, and he, he talks that way too. I'll abort for these reasons, uh, which I went to end of life later, and it just doesn't seem to, I just don't see it as making sense. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think here, I think he's just, um, I, I'm not sure if it's the time relative interest thing or whether he's just, it's the asymmetry thing, which is uh, maybe he thinks of it slightly differently, which is that it just doesn't get counted. Yeah, right? but I mean, it came yeah. up in response to Parfit's objection. Parfit goes, what if someone just came into existence a minute ago and now to save their life, I break their leg? How could mm -hmm. that really matter from a moment earlier? Um, we don't bring them into existence because they'll have a broken leg. And then his response was, well, we're talking about moral existence. There really is a big, it's gradual. There's gonna be more of a time gap. And he gave this type of like example. 
um, in response to Parfit trying to undermine um, that how could, why can you, why would this harm be rel relevant after existence and not before? Why don't we just add up um, right. goods and bads and so forth? Anyway. Yeah. Um, so Vivka Weinberg also used an example uh, or uses an example where, you know, she sort of imagines that we were born as adults, right? Like we, when mm -hmm. we're born, we're already full grown adults, right? Um, and so it sounds like that's kind of similar to what Parfit was trying to drive at. So imagine that you're born as a grown adult and then your leg is broken. Like as soon as you're born, you know, um, something happens to your leg, right? And so I think I agree with you, David. So sort of, uh, so the idea is something like, well, once you're born, it seems like you have an interest in continuing to live. We have an interest in helping you with your leg and so on and so forth. Um, but prior to your being born, uh, Benatar wants to say something like, um, well, I mean, could he say something like, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm kind of stabbing in the dark here because uh, I don't remember that particular exchange mm -hmm. with Derek. Um, but I, I, so I'm trying to figure out whether what he would say is something like, uh, look, um, the issue here is whether we should bring this person into existence in the uh, in the first place, right? Um, and so, um, and there he wants to say, that's a different question. Maybe that's what he means by more existence. Whether we should bring an individual who's gonna then have a leg broken. You know, he thinks, well, the harm of that is, you know, there's a net harm, right? Because the benefit of the existence doesn't get counted, right? And so there's just the net harm of the person with the broken leg. And if that's gonna be the case, then we shouldn't bring this person into existence. But of course, once this person is in existence, we should try to help this person because now this person has a interest in continuing to live and so on and so forth. I'm not sure if that's helpful. But yeah, but I mean, there's some, he's not just gonna rely on the asymmetry. He, went to, he would have just repeated that argument and not, told you this other story about harms not being as bad early in existence or when you're coming into existence. Um, I wonder if other things just don't bleed into the general judgment people have that these are good reasons. It might be when you're creating a life, these are burdens on other people. When you're continuing life, you usually think it's just a burden on them or, or other things coming into play, like, you know, it's just not a harm to be created in the first place. But he does seem to think he has to give this argument in the 2006 about distinguishing continuing from starting. And when you ask whether life's worth living, you know, it's ambiguous. And um, the, the reasons they may continue a life aren't reasons to start a life. But if we're talking about person affecting things, I mean, it just seems these are person affecting harms and they're very insignificant at the time you're making that decision. So it, it almost seems like a cheat. They're just saying, well, there's not much person loses out on, either when they don't exist or they barely exist, but there's a great harm, this thing. But at that time, it's not a great harm and it doesn't become a harm to later. And then later it just gets offset. I don't see how you can avoid the, the attitudes we have to continuing lives. Um, you have to just do that balance in there. I mean, I take it he just didn't want to give the asymmetry argument. This was something in addition. And yeah. then my question was just, he, is he really committed to, in everyone's life, the harms are worse than the um, uh, benefits? Is that your view? He is committed to that everyone's life will have more harms than benefits? Yeah, that's what he's trying to say. That's the sort of the argument about uh, positives are not enough, right? With chapter three. You, yeah, yeah. But I mean, is that compatible with his claim about many of us do not have a reason of suicide. More of us have a reason to suicide than we think. Because we're yeah. probably- <laughs> Right, comparative. right. But um, are those claims compatible that uh, there, there's insufficient positives and we have, many of us have reasons to continue lives or are they not as related as I think? I mean, if yeah, you have a I reason mean, to continue alive, isn't that then the net negatives, net 
positives are greater, positives are sufficient. Or yeah. we just talk about starting a life and I've changed the, changed the subject. I, so I, I see what you're asking, David. So um, it's um, tricky to answer. So maybe what he wants to say is that, so let's suppose that it's true that we have more negatives in our lives than positives in our life, right? So one question, one question is, does that mean we should go kill ourselves, right? right? right. And so I think his response there is, well, no, because... Uh, I think he wants to say no, right? And he wants to say no because uh, there's something also that's even more negative uh, if you were to kill yourself or go through the process of killing yourself or et cetera, et cetera. And so maybe he could agree that, okay, maybe, so I think he might think it's compatible with this view that even though the negatives outweigh the positives in our lives, yeah. nevertheless, the killing itself, killing of ourselves, right. committing suicide and stuff like that, is a bad for us. It's bad for us too, right? Intrinsically speaking, and so on and so forth. And so, therefore, that's a reason not to do that uh, for most of us, or something. Like All right. That. So they are yeah. compatible claims. Okay, got you. Uh, well, I, I'm just I'm making up. Like right. I don't know what he actually would say, but I can see him deciding. Yeah, Travis, you want to jump in? Yeah. Oh yeah, just briefly, since you said that, that's exactly right. And in his 2016 book, he tries to flush that out by appealing to, I think something that Francis Cam says in one of her earlier works, uh, where uh, he agrees with her that annihilation of a existing person, he wants to say is a bad over and above any sort of deprivational harm. And that's supposed to provide this extra thing about why it would be imprudent for existing people uh, to commit uh, suicide, but not um, good for them to have come into existence in the first place, because uh, preventing them from coming into existence doesn't annihilate a being that has moral value, according to uh, David Benatar. Um, but killing yourself once you do exist is annihilating a being that has moral value. I don't think that works for a variety of reasons, including the fact that if you don't kill yourself now, you're still going to be annihilated later. So it's unclear why, uh, you know, you get this, you incur an additional bad if you Bring about annihilation sooner rather than later but that but you're absolutely right that that is his view and that's why he wants that's he recognizes that tension that david hirshenoff is raising and he tries to resolve it in that way thank you travis that, that's right yeah did, did that help david yeah thank you yeah all right uh Dan Shi, and then i'll go after okay thank you so much um so full disclosure i'm not really formally trained in philosophy um actually an art student, like a grad graduate art student, and I am an antinatalist. So I'm surrounded by people who seem to not agree with me. And uh, one thing that I wanted to, oh, may, maybe a quick comment to tag on the earlier conversation about um, starting a life and continuing a life. Um, I always think about the analogy of going into a theater to watch a really bad movie, because I actually had like a lived experience of going to watch Men of Steel in theater with a friend. It was like a two hour and 30 minute movie. It was so bad, but, but we sat through the whole thing. But you know, if we knew how bad it was, there's no way in hell that we would have, you know, stepped into the theater. So <laughs> I guess, you know, completely non-philosophical, uh, intuitively, experientially, it's very, it makes a lot of sense in my head, um, but, but that's not actually my question. So I have, I guess, two questions. Uh, one is, I vaguely remember Benatar talking about the experiential asymmetry in pain and benefits. Uh, so for example, will we trade enduring five minutes of extreme pain to receive five minutes of extreme benefit or pleasure? And most people will say no. And I think he went on that um, route, kind of trying to portray how there's an asymmetry in these two you know, things. And, but in the talk, uh, I think I've mostly heard about the amount, the, the pure amount of uh, you know benefit versus harm. So I so I guess that would be like one of my questions. And another one of my question uh, goes back to you know earlier a lot of people talked about the implausible implications um, that let, um, Dr. Liao you you argue to be implied by the asiological symmetry. Um, uh, once again, I I am personally inclined to believe that Benatar 
makes a distinction between someone who doesn't exist and someone who does, you know, partly portrayed by the continuing to exist versus like starting your existence. Uh, but also um, not having read your paper, just from what I've heard, I wonder how your arguments are very different from Dr. Christine Overall's arguments, also against the asymmetry. Um, so it was from her book, Why Have Children? So that was kind of like a dated text. And Benatar addressed that in a later article. Um, and one of the reasons that I, as I understood why he thinks uh, the, those arguments failed was, in my understanding, he thinks that an absent benefit, you know, it's not bad unless there's somebody for whom this absent is a deprivation. And for me, it seemed, it, because in those cases that Dr. Overall posed, uh, they, they were comparing existent individuals and whether they take certain risks um, so as to avoid certain harm. And so I, I kind of see some parallels uh, between those and what, what you proposed. Uh, and, and, and I think that was some of Benedict's um, counter arguments. So those are my two questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan Chi. Those are excellent. Uh, you should be doing philosophy. Uh, um, so uh, maybe I can work backwards. So um, the, I guess one thing Benatar could say is, look, the asymmetry applies only to uh, sort of existence, non-existence and nowhere else. Right. I think that's uh, I, I got a sense that that was roughly what you're gesturing at. Um, but if that's true, I don't think he can use the sick and healthy example. So I think in using the sick and healthy example, he he actually wrote this. So in his paper, he sort of said that uh, it actually doesn't have you can. The, he wants to say that the asymmetry can apply uh, in between existent people as well. Right. So I think there he also thinks that the asymmetry explains uh, uh, sort of the distance versus the, you know, the near or something like that. You know, like there are a bunch of cases where he gives where he thinks the asymmetry can explain um, where we're talking about existing individuals. Um, so but but the sick and healthy one is currently it's, it's certainly a case where uh, two people are in existence. I, I agree with you that if you were to move to just sort of restrict the asymmetry to uh, sort of existence and non-existence, then those arguments uh, wouldn't go through because they rely on existing individuals. Um, but I think that, um, then, but now the view faces a problem, which is that, well, hey, you know, how convenient that it just works for here and doesn't work anywhere else, right? So, you know, that's a typical move in philosophy where, you know, it's like, well, you're trying to explain this, but like, is it, is it just too generous? It's just sort of, it just happens, this distinction happens to work here, but nowhere else. So that's kind of what I would say. Um, and um, so I, I've read Christine Overall's uh, book, but I'm not exactly sure which part you're referring to. So I, I you know, like, you want to say more about which part of the argument, but I take it the general gist is more about the existent versus non-existent. Um, the, the, your first point is about the experiential uh, point. Um, and I think you're, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, Benatar wants to say something like, you know, um, you know, the pain could last a long time while the benefits could last just you know, a short time, right? So it's not just um, like he does want to make that claim as well, right? Um, and I was happy to grant him all the experiential claims, right? But what he needs to show is that um, you know what what I was saying, what I was, uh, and he sort of says, you know, we don't realize that we're not recognizing that, you know, that sometimes you know, like these features of pain and um, you know benefits in our lives. And I was basically granting him all his claims, but, but saying that just empirically speaking, it's very hard to establish that, that that doesn't show that therefore we in fact have more pains in our lives than benefits or pleasures in our lives, right? And you know, this is a this is a sort of a known problem in philosophy. It's like it's called the calculation problem. Like, how do you actually go about calculating? And nobody really knows. You know, everybody takes a stab at it, but. You know, it's it's um, as far as I know, Benatar hasn't done the 
uh, the tallying up of all the experiences. So we still need to uh, have reasons to believe that really the experiences of pain tallies up to be more than the experiences of pleasure, like even granting what you just said. And there's just, um, you know, like, um, um, yeah, it's, it's not obvious to me. I mean, some of what he says about experiences uh, are also not that true, right? So just take like, he sort of says experiences of pain is like, you know, just take, uh, since we're talking about natalism or antinatalism, take like childbirth, right? So childbirth or, you know, um, my wife tells me that, you know, sort of, you know, like she, you know, sort of the, the pain of giving birth, you know, it's very painful, but we tend to forget it. But you think of the experience, the lifetime experience of the joy of having children for some people anyways, not, not everybody, um, don't want to overgeneralize, but, you know, sort of um, that could last a long, long time, right? Or just sort of the, the pleasure, the experience of, uh, I don't know, publishing your first book, right? Could last a really long time. So again, it's just I think that uh, Benatar, or you know, anyways, um, you know, Benatar just hasn't done those tallying up, and that was sort of my claim. And you know, I want to say the same thing about this desire fulfillment as well. Um, was that helpful? Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Denshi. Um, as well uh, as one of our guests joining in so boldly. That's great. Um, so I, I had a question uh, about the uh, second counterintuitive implication. This is again along the lines of what Travis was saying. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if we suppose we're an antinatalist, maybe we would just be thinking if this is a good way of going about this, then maybe the burdens only seem implausible because I'm sorry. Uh, the implications only seem impossible because they have like a really big burden attached, uh, perhaps relative to alternatives. So if so, then this argument would really show that social interactions like have a risk of procreation and these are to be weighed against this other alternative like uh, the burden of getting sterilized. And so perhaps I have an obligation to get sterilized when it's safe, available, affordable, easy, so on. But like, that's weighed against like the cumulative risk that social interactions have for procreation. And so insofar as it's like impossible, it's only because we've been like ignoring this alternative, like just get sterilized. Um, but if that's, if that's where this argument goes, uh, I'm wondering if it follows that we should have like two different standards for people uh, like children and postmenopausal women, they don't have this burden of going out and having these social interactions and women, because they, it's harder, more difficult, more dangerous to be sterilized, uh, they also like have a different standard compared to men who could more, more or less easily get sterilized. Yeah, great, great, great question. So yeah, I mean, you know, again, um, if you if uh, if you want, if Benatar wants to bite the bullet and say, hey, we should just get everyone sterilized. Um, I think he, that he probably would uh, be okay with that or think that, that there's a moral reason to, right? Um, and that would, um, but I think that, um, um, but just pointing out that implication, right? Like how do we, how do we get there, right? So he doesn't specifically make that a feature. He doesn't, you know, at least sort of broadcast, hey, look, my view implies entails that, you know, we have to sterilize everybody, you know, or, you know, at least childbearing, you know, individuals, right? Um, and so if that's a implication of this view, it's, it's important to point that out so that we can evaluate that view properly, right? And so I think I'll be okay with sort of saying, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty drastic implication, don't you think? Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, if we just sit back and, you know, uh, thinking that everybody, like all childbearing people, should get sterilized, right? So, um, what do you think, Jonathan? I mean, I think it is, but like, <laughs> if you're you're going to go that route, then you'd need to have like this extra step of the argument saying, but we don't have an obligation to get sterilized because it, you know, it's part of our biological fundamental, you know, rights or something like that, something like that. Which I mean, you do give like we have a right to that biology, but or the 
yeah, to be able to do that. But that, yeah. that basically, that would have to be where you would close the, the door here. Um, but it, it does also seem like a little counterintuitive, to me at least, uh, to say we have different standards for whether you are able to procreate and whether you can like go and have social interactions. Like, no, 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 you got to stay inside because like you're, you're not in heat, but like you're close enough to be able to have that kind of risk or something. Yeah. I mean, so, you, so I think um, that's why, you know, from the positive side, I don't, what I say is exactly what you just said, which is, I think you have a right to control. You don't, you have a right not to be sterilized, right? You have a right to procreate and so, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to give the positive argument for why, um, you know, that's the case. Um, and yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Uh, next, we've got Pat Daly and then uh, Phil Reed, part two. Hi, uh, Matthew, thanks very much uh, for your talk and paper. Um, David uh, really asked the, uh, excuse me. Uh, David asked uh, the, my, uh, covered the main points or uh, things I had questions about, but maybe a, as a follow-up uh, uh, to your comments and Travis's, uh, does Benatar go so far as to express an opinion about uh, uh, the value of uh, we could live forever or uh, efforts to extend human life? Uh, that's one question. And then the other in terms of um, uh, non-human life, uh, does it, is that not a moral consideration for him or is he against bringing uh, non-human life into existence? Uh, yeah, so I think that, um, well, just taking the non-human life into I you might think that the argument sort of also applies, right? So presumably the asymmetry would, uh, that would be true, you know, for non-human life. Um, but I, I guess um, uh, he might say, well, it's one thing that nature just kind of takes place. It's another question whether we have a, um, we have a duty to go out there to prevent life from coming into existence because of the asymmetry and things like that. So um, I was that, that's roughly what I was trying to hint at with my third objection, right? That if the asymmetry goes through, it seems to imply that, um, you know, when we eat, uh, grow vegetables, we're sort of in effect creating a lot of sentient you know, bring a lot more sentient entities into existence. And that would, um, that seems to, uh, and we shouldn't be, on his view, that seems to be a net harm and isn't that a problem for him. So I, I was kind of hinting at that uh, as well. Um, on the first point is, um, I think you're asking about sort of living forever. Um, so I, um, well, it, it's interesting because on the one hand, he, you know, he thinks that we should just sort of, I guess he, his view implies that we should just die out, right? Because we shouldn't bring any more people into existence. Uh, on the other hand, he seems to like his, what he says about objective good, you know, he thinks that life, you know, like, well, one example he used was actually living longer, right? And so, it sounds like he thinks that living longer would be better, right? So, because he sort of says that human life, he gives the example of human lifespan being kind of real, still really short, right? And that, you know, if it's a good, then it could actually, um, you know, like maybe we should want more of it, right? Um, but maybe that's a conditional claim, like conditional on you thinking that uh, living longer is good, uh, living, you know, like having enough life is good, then uh, then living longer is better. So, uh, so maybe that's what he thinks. So, did I, did I, was I? Uh, that's, yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Phil? This might be a little, a little too nitpicky, but I guess I'll ask it anyways. Um, yeah. So Benatar says there's this asymmetry, a benefit in existence for X, but it's not an advantage 
uh, for over the, the absence of, of a benefit when X does not exist. And then to give this um, asymmetry, help us understand it, he gives us healthy and sick analogy. Um, and then you attack the analogy um, on page six. You say, well, look, you know, it's not that surprising that something could be good uh, for one individual, but then not be good or bad for another individual. And then you have this sentence, a more suitable example for Benatar would be one in which something is good for an individual and neither good nor bad for the same individual. And my question is, what does that mean, <laughs> that sentence mean? And then is it any more analogous? Because after all, his original case is uh, benefit for a person who exists and then uh, absence of benefit for when that person doesn't exist. Whereas you're imagining a good, uh, a benefit for an individual and then neither a good or benefit for that individual. Both, I assume that means existing individual. Right, so um, in the case of existence, um, he's talking about the same individual, right? How, uh, uh, non-existence is not bad for that same individual, right? So he's just talking about one person, right? Um, when he's comparing the goods and bads. That's how I read the argument, right? And yeah. so what I was saying was in the case of sick and healthy, we're talking about two different people. And when we talk about two different people, it's not too surprising that something can be good for one person and not be good for another person. That happens all the time, right? What's, but what he needs that I was suggesting seems to be an example because he wants to make the, the example supposed to be analogous to the existence case where it's only talking about one person, right? So it's, you know, it's like uh, existence is not bad for that person, right? Or something like that, right? Um, and so what I was just trying to say there is that, well, uh, it would be better to give an example where it's, it, you know, uh, something is, you know, if you, if you want to use a, and this is his example, right? He's using an ex, ex, uh, existent uh, uh, individual as an example to sort of support the asymmetry in the, um, in the other case, right? And so I was, so now I was thinking that, well, if you want to do that, then you should really come up with an example where it just, that what this, the same type of asymmetry applies to um, like, uh, that same individual, so intra, uh, you know, comparison rather than inter comparison. Does that does that make sense? Um, yeah. So, um, like, it, it would be more analogous, right, to the existence case if the comparison were also uh, between it, it were also between the same individual. So. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to belabor a, a single sentence. So. I'll, 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 I'll pass on a follow-up, thanks. Yeah, oh, yeah. So All right. if you wanna write, write to me and like, love, love to hear what further thoughts you have about that. Sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. Oh, no worries. Um, next we've got Steve Kirshner, then back to Kirshner. Uh, interesting talk, thank you. Um, my, my question is I wanna understand sort of your account of a, a human right compared to let's say self-ownership. Yeah. So here's my question. Does a person have a human right to kill himself? And my concern is that if autonomy is going to be a central feature of a human right, it would seem that the person would have a human right to kill himself. But if um, what justifies a human right is a good life, it would seem that he does not have a right to kill himself. He's perfectly healthy, just minor, minor, he has minor depression. Um, so where self-ownership is going to give us a real clean, clean account of this. So I guess my question is just that, does, on your account, does a person have a human right to kill himself if he's perfectly healthy and will have a very good life, he's just depressed for a short while? Um, oh, so that, uh, so that that's slightly different uh, uh, I, from where I thought you were going. So a person who's healthy and, um, I mean, so there's the right to autonomy is a fundamental condition, but you, there are also a bunch of other things, right? Um, like the fundamental conditions, it's not just restricted to that. And so um, I 
don't think that, well, you know, there's a question of whether we should assist somebody uh, to kill himself, right? If, if he has like the full set of fundamental conditions. And there I have actually argued this in print that no, we, we shouldn't do that, right? Because precisely because this person has the full set of fundamental conditions, right? Um, and so like other things being equal, right? If the person is just depressed, right? Then we shouldn't do that, right? Because uh, not because of the good life, it's because we have a right in so, uh, but I don't have to say that because uh, from the good life perspective, because they might have a very bad life or they might get, they might not have a life after this. Like they might, as soon as you do that, as soon as you like tell them, no, we're not going to help you. They walk out and they get hit by a car. So they could die right away. Like sort of that's outside our control, right? What we have a control over is just like what we can do to help them with their fundamental conditions or, you know, like uh, obtaining and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, but there may be cases where um, someone might exercise, reasonably exercise the right to kill himself. So for example, in a case where you don't have all the fundamental conditions. So imagine that you're uh, quadriplegic, you get into an accident, you're fully conscious, whatever, but you, know, you have very diminished uh, capacities and you're not gonna be able to regain those capacities anymore, right? Um, in that case, um, there could be like, I, you know, it may be, it's maybe okay to sort of say that, yeah, um, you know, in this case, maybe we should assist this individual. Like we could, you know, I, I can see an argument um, and the re uh, for assisting this individual. And the reason would be because this person no longer, and it's not gonna be able to recover the fundamental capacities you know, that she needs in order to pursue the good life. You know, she's stuck, she keep, you know, whatever, um, and things like that, right? So, so it depends on what we're, you know, depends on the case, um, yeah. So, so, oh, sorry. So just yeah. so I understood, on your account, as a general matter, there's no human right to kill yourself. And so autonomy takes a back seat or gets trumped by other features of the good life. So even though in certain conditions, there might be a right to kill yourself, there's no general such right based on human rights. So, so autonomy really isn't playing that large a role because it seems to be either trumped or disappear with regard to a major decision with regard to your life. So, okay, I mean, the way I would uh, describe my view is slightly different. I start with sort of the fundamental conditions that we have. And that you might use that to divide other rights, like the right to kill yourself or the right to privacy or the right to whatever, right? Um, and so um, in, the, in that, if you think of it that way, then there's the right to autonomy, there's sort of autonomy is a fundamental condition. There's also liberty is a fundamental condition. There's also the capacity to think is a fundamental condition and so on and so forth, right? Now we put them together and we think about a particular case, right? So in a particular case, uh, when these things conflict, right? So in a case where you want, to, uh, you want to kill yourself because you don't have any of the other capacities, like you can still think, but you can't do anything and you know, you're kind of stuck, you're quadriplegic and so on and so forth. In that case, we ask the, the, the further question, do I have a right to kill myself, right? Um, that is different. I want to say from a case where you have your full sets of fundamental capacities, say, right? And you, you ask the question, do I have a right to kill myself? So that's how I would go about thinking through these issues. Um, does that make sense? It makes sense. The, the problem I have is that you really, again, I, and I might be missing it. It seems like you're really downgrading autonomy. So, um, uh, oh, so I'm, I'm not... I'm not a libertarian, if, if that's what you're like, if is you know, so, so I think autonomy is one important, like, you know, fundamental capacity, but we have a bunch of other things and they get, you know, they get put into this mix where sometimes the autonomy is more important, sometimes it's not, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, but that doesn't mean that autonomy doesn't matter. 
right? It's still a fundamental capacity. It's just sort of like, it's, but we have other fundamental capacities. And so when you put that into the mix, uh, different things will come out differently depending on the context and depending on the situation. So that might sound like, and so in that sense, yes, um, if you have like a autonomy only or autonomy first uh, view, then this view, and then I am downgrading autonomy. So then I, I, I do have to admit to that. So, but if it's a view saying that if you're, if there's a different view, which is you're just eliminating autonomy, this view doesn't eliminate autonomy, right? It sort of says autonomy is one feature among a bunch of other things. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to let uh, John Liza like jump in and then we'll do Hershenov, uh, assuming we have enough time. Thanks for the talk. I, I haven't really followed um, Benatar's work uh, in the, past the, the 1997 paper, but I, I was curious, um, uh, what, uh, in, the, in the early paper, he talks about pain. He makes this argument, and, and but you've replaced it, and I assume he has also with the with the idea of harm instead of pain. And I was curious as to why he did that and um, how significant that might be, especially when you mentioned sort of this idea of moral harms. You know, his invoking Francis Cam Cam's idea to somehow uh, support the idea that suicide isn't. Uh, may not be the right thing to do. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so maybe the pain and pleasure talk is works where, well, better in the, if you take like a hedonistic theory of well being, uh, but it might not work as well in other contexts, like maybe desire fulfillment or objective lists. And so, uh, so there was uh, some reason to broaden that a little bit, right? Um, and, um, I mean, you, I mean, you could reduce it to like, if, if you're hedonist, you think frustrated desires are painful, right? So, you know, in that sense, you can kind of combine the two, but I take it, you, you know, like some people maybe want to pull those things apart. And so, um, so maybe that's why he doesn't focus on pain. Um, that, that, I'm, I'm speculating here. So, um. Travis, do you know? Um, yeah. I don't, but that seems very plausible to me, especially since in the human predicament and in uh, Better Never Have Been, he talks about his view for different accounts of well-being. So I think you just, I think you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. But there's not any kind of, uh, it, uh, he's not invoking any sort of moral harm in the kind of Kantian sense. Uh, that's not. Right. Right. So, so, okay. So yeah, I just wondered then whether an objection could be raised along those lines to his view. Uh, I mean, if he seems to consider, I, I'm not sure why then the suicide, um, you know, what is really the objection to suicide? Um, so I think he thinks that suicide uh, for like, it's, it could be, that for the person, right? Once the person is already, it's like existing, then it could be bad for that individual to die, right? Um, and for the reasons that Travis had mentioned, like one reason could be, I mean, there could be the, uh, one reason could be just this annihilation of the status, right? Um, and that, that could be bad for the person uh, to have lost that, lost that, right? Um, I'm not sure why that. What? Why? I don't know, Travis. What? Why? Why would that be? Uh, the losing a status. Why would that be? Uh, somehow a harm to the individual. Uh, in his view, I just. I, I mean, yeah. He he just thinks that it is a plausible axiom that the uh, something that is very valuable going out of existence is intrinsically bad and that the bearer of that intrinsic badness is the valuable thing. He thinks that's independently valuable, but he also thinks it does a lot of theoretical work in explaining our asymmetrical judgments about uh, the deprivational harms of prenatal and postmortem non-existence. Um, and so he thinks it helps do explanatory work in solving other sorts of puzzles about the philosophy of death. I mean, I don't, 
necessarily think that's successful, but that's that's why he does think that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Travis. All right, uh, Hershenov. Uh, Matthew, you said in passing um, that newborns had great moral status and typically they, to be a right holder, you have to possess the genetic basis of um, for moral agency. So someone who's had the genetic basis for moral agency, but it was blocked by the environment would have full status and rights. But if they were missing a necessary gene, they wouldn't, that sounds um, problematic. And then do you really, why would our rights just depend on moral agency? Imagine we had a genetic Phineas Gage who was able to do all sorts of fancy reflective things, but wasn't a moral agent, was sort of a psychopath. Are you really restricting rights to beings with a genetic basis of moral agency? Yeah, good, good question. So, uh, so the, in the paper where I talk about this, the moral status, um, I broaden it. I sort of say uh, the genetic basis for moral agency sort of, well, we're, gene we're, we're you know, sort of, um, yeah, most of the living things that we know are, you know, based on sort of DNAs and, you know, their carbon-based DNA, you know, life forms. And so that's why I talk about the genetic basis. But uh, saying that, uh, you can imagine, um, you know, you can broaden that out. You can be a functionalist about that, right? Maybe we don't need the carbon base. It could be something else. And so the true view really should be the physical basis for more agency. And so that's what I say, but, you know, for convenience sake and just sort of, you know, like also the physical sure. basis is, uh, you know, like a mouthful. So anyway, so that, that's why, but, you know, so I do, I, I agree with you uh, about that. Um, I distinguish between um, genes that undermine the development of moral agency, right? From genes where uh, that, you know, where, sort of you're, you're already a moral agent, but somehow you're blocked, right? Because, you know, um, like it, it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, I distinguish a case like where you just lack the gene for more, uh, for more agency from a case where you're blocked, right? Okay, so take, for example, PKU. It's a very debilitating genetic disease, right? Um, it turned, and so, you know, after, if, you, if it's not treated, uh, you, uh, you know, basically it sort of, it doesn't convert certain amino acids, right? And if it's not treated, then you become like pretty much, uh, it, there's a lot of mental retardation and so on. It affects your brain. And then a lot of, of these children, they die very early. Okay. So, but interestingly enough, with PKU, it's a single gene disease. So in this case, it turns out that if you just give proper uh, su supplements to the child, then the child will be able to um, have a normal functioning brain and have a normal, roughly normal life if you catch it early enough, okay? And so here's a case where I say, this is a case where uh, we can kind of look back and say this child has moral agency, but somehow the moral agency has the genetic basis for moral agency, but the genetic basis for moral agency was undermined, right? By, by sort of, uh, you know, by, because something else, like something's blocking it from, you know, like there's genes that are not functioning. So, you know, and then we, how do we know this? Because we know that this child has uh, the genetic basis for moral agency because just by giving the child supplements, right? Amino acid supplements, this child, has, uh, can have moral agency. So, you know, like that's it, right? Um, contrast that with the case where um, you just don't have the genetic basis for moral agency. And that's very different. And so uh, I was willing to sort of say those two cases are very different, right? And yeah, so um, anyways, um, did that? Yeah. Um, and will the rights, could you have rights if you didn't have gene um, the genetic basis for moral agency, but were intellectually and emotionally impressive in other ways. Like somebody who was, who was like a Phineas Gage, but genetically so. Well, Phineas Gage had the genetic basis for moral agency. Right, right. right. I'm just saying, imagine they were genetically incapable of moral agency, but been able to do 
rather self-conscious reflective sure. intellectual. Yeah, good, good. So the, the genetic is, basis, right? yeah. So the genetic basis for more agency is a sufficient condition. Um, mm -hmm. As I argue my work, it's not a necessary okay. condition. So you could think, look, there could be other things that are sufficient for right holding and so on and so forth, right? So people talk about AI, right? AI, super intelligent AIs might be like, uh, they might not have moral agency, but they might be super smart. So maybe they get some moral status, maybe close to rights holding in virtue of being super intelligent, right? But yet they don't have moral agency. Um, so that, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we'll be finishing up with Travis uh, with the last question. Oh, thank you. So uh, I wanted to ask about Benatar's arguments that the bads outweigh the goods. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that he hasn't provided any argument to add them all up. And I also am inclined to agree that, you know, if we were able to add them up, the goods would outweigh the bads for most people. But uh, he does cite some psychological studies that uh, purportedly give us reason to think that the bads outweigh the goods. And I was just curious what your thoughts were about those. Uh, you probably know more than me. I don't know much about it, by which I mean, I don't know anything at all about the psychological literature. Uh, but he does say in chapter four of the human predicament that um, we have a sort of optimism bias That's right. shown in psychological yeah. studies. Because if you ask people how well they're doing, most will say that they uh, are doing well on any given day and that they rate themselves above the mean. Now, I'm not sure why that means that they're being biased of, in favor of their own well-being rather than being overtly overly pessimistic about other people's well-being but that's one piece of evidence the other seems to be uh like basically the hedonic treadmill thinks when we have objective changes to our standards of well-being we only uh recognize that subjectively for a short period of time and then we kind of revert back to the mean um i'm not sure why that counts either but that's one thing that he says and then the um Last thing that he says, which is uh, sort of uh, interesting, is that um, he thinks when we compare how well we're doing in these psychological studies, we're essentially comparing ourselves to other existing beings. But if there's ailments that are so prevalent that they affect all of humanity, then those will be uh, routinely discounted. And that if we took notice of those, then we would see that the bad outweighs the good. I think I think that's a faithful reconstruction of what uh, yeah. What do, you, what do you suggest? So anyway, I just wanted to run that by you and, and see what your thoughts were. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. So the, um, yeah, I wasn't, I mean, I, I was, so in the paper, I was just granting him all that, right? That we have the, this optimism bias and so on and so forth. And so say, let's give you everything like that you said, like, it's true, we missed all this. And even if it's true, you still haven't shown that in fact, <laughs> the bads outweigh the goods, right? Because, you know, like try to tally it up. And they're also, I mean, also, you know, there could be a pessimism bias, right? There's a philosophers talk about melancholy, like, like somehow some people think that, I think uh, Carl Elliott thinks that somehow we uh, have a, it's like a kind of fetishism for melancholy. We want things to be bad, you know, sort of think of the Schopenhauerian, you know, type, you know, situation, right? And so, um, you know, it could go the other way, but anyways, uh, so one, uh, but, you know, I, I was just trying to cut through all that and sort of say, well, even if we grant you all your claims, it's still the case that you just haven't tallied any of this up. And so that doesn't, either we don't have enough reasons to think that, you know, the bads outweigh the goods. Um, but in fact, like, um, I mean, you might think, I mean, if we want to sort of go through each of the claims, just take the optimism bias. If you're a hedonist, like, um, isn't like, like, does that even matter? Like, isn't just sort of, if you think that you're having a good life, like if you think your life's going well, isn't that enough? Like you, you're experiencing it, you think that it is, like, doesn't that count for something for a hedonist? Like, um, uh, so, you know, and, and if there's a lot of that, if you have a lot of optimism bias, that would seem to suggest, at least from a humanistic perspective, <laughs> there's a lot of positive in your life, right? It doesn't matter that you're, like, only if you're objectivist, you would sort of say, oh, well, uh, you're, in fact, mistaken. 
about, you know, you know, you don't, you know, like you don't have those goods, right? You know, you're, you're missing all the objective goods, but just at least from a hedonist perspective, I don't see a problem with having the optimism bias. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I agree that with the hedonist, if you have an optimism bias, it's going to be good for you insofar as it'll bring you more net uh, hedonic utility than you would otherwise get. Uh, although I do think Benatar could say, well, even so, you're just mistaken about what the objective calculation is. Uh, so if you actually counted up all the hedons and dollars, you would see that the dollars uh, outnumbered the hedons. Um, and your optimism bias might make it closer than it would otherwise be, but it's still the case that you have more dollars than, than I hedons in there. Um, but it. I mean, I just don't mm -hmm. think that's a particularly plausible assumption to make about um, what the calculation would be. And I don't, uh, just from his descriptions of the psychological studies, don't see how it has that sort of, I don't see how that inference that he makes is warranted, even given, even assuming that his description of the psychological studies are in fact accurate. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought of going through, uh, but it seems like uh, it just boils down to, because, uh, you know, you can kind of go through each case and then he would have something to say back, right? Um, and then it was, I, and in the, in the end, I thought it was more economical, more efficient just to get to the point and sort of say, well, uh, we just haven't, we need to, in order to, uh, be convinced of this claim, we need to see that really the bads, in fact, outweigh the goods, you know? So even if it's true that we have underestimated the amounts of bads in our lives. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks. Great. Well, that should be, whoops. <laughs> My <laughs> I just fell down. <laughs> yeah, so that concludes uh, our talk. Thank you um, so much, uh, Matthew Lau. Uh, next Thank week, you. we're going to be having uh, Jason Everill uh, give his uh, talk on uh, genetic enhancements and human nature. And uh, at this point, I'm going to stop recording and uh, we can continue to socialize. Let's see.